be seated. And uh, this morning we have a special guest. Uh, we have Hal Hansen and his family. Most of you know Hal. Most of you do. And uh, go ahead, Anita. Go ahead. Anita signed up for clapping in the <laughs> ministry's book, so we, we allow her to be clapping. Thank you. I need, uh, well, I don't. I can't tell a joke today since I'm not doing the sermon. So, uh, and many of you are relieved by that fact. Not doing a joke. But uh, Hal works with uh, New Tribes Missions, and he was one of the the people organizations that the Lord laid us on laid on our heart to initially support. We selected ten different individuals, groups that we felt the Lord was leading us to help. So uh, he's going to come and share because a lot of you don't know how. And he's going to come share about their, uh, about what they do and how they do it and how the Lord has worked through his life. And he's going to share the work with us because uh, I think it's important that uh, the people that we support with our monies and with our prayers, remember we covenanted all the, the missions people that we, that we support, we, we not only support them financially, we support them with our prayers. And it's important for you to hear his heart and hear how the Lord is speaking to him so that he can speak to us. So, we want to welcome you. We welcome your family. I'll let you introduce everybody. And uh, God bless you. just want to say thank you for the opportunity to share here this morning. And I do know a lot of you. There are a lot of new faces also, so I just want to take a minute to introduce us. My name's Hal. This is my wife, Beth. I can speak loud enough. Okay. Um, Marty Riley is Beth's mom. So a lot of you know Marty. And um, Beth was at the hospital early this morning and visited her. This is my son, Riley. Whoa, that's getting loud. He's um, <laughs> going to be a junior in college. And this is my daughter Jane, and she's going to be, you know, become a freshman, be starting as a freshman in college. And that's part of the reason why we're in the States right now, is to get them, you know, he's been in college, but get her started in school. And uh, we just praise the Lord for the timing, with Beth's mom being ill, that um, Beth was able to be here and be a support and be help for that. Okay, you guys can sit.
Bible is pretty important. So we do Bible translation. So we might have to develop an alphabet. Teach them their own alphabet. Teach them how to read and write their own language. They speak it already. So some New Tribes missionaries do that. They teach literacy. Some do Bible translation. And then we teach the Word. And um, I understand that this church is uh, developing along the lines of elder leadership. And that's one thing that we stress in the tribal works that we do is that it's the local people who are going to be the leaders. The missionary goes there, he's not the pastor. He's the teacher when he first gets there, but eventually the missionary, the foreigner, is going to pull out. And we want to leave them with the Word of God, and we want to leave them with leaders who've been trained, who've been discipled, who can now um, do evangelism among their own people, go out to other villages and do evangelism, and see the Church of Christ spread throughout the world. Um, so that's in a nutshell, what New Tribes is about. If anybody wants to talk to me more about New Tribes, I'm glad to talk to them yeah, and talk also about that. Normally, a missionary with New Tribes mission uh, gets some training in the U.S., then goes to a foreign country, learns the national language of that foreign country. And then after that, they pray with the leadership, New Tribes leadership in that country, and they pick a tribe that they're going to go work in. It might be a new work where there's not been a missionary yet. It might be a work where there's some missionaries, but they need more help. And so the missionary makes a decision. God leads, and they go, and they, they live among that people. So they're learning a new culture. They're learning a new language. And then they begin to help uh, disciple the believers there, or teach, teach the people, or evangelize, and then disciple. That's what most new tribers do. That's not what we do. That's what we were planning to do 15 years ago when we went to Thailand. Um, 15 years? 13. 16 years ago? Okay. 16 years ago when we finished the training with New Tribes Mission here in the States, we, we thought we were going to do that. We were going to move to Thailand and work in a tribal, with a tribal group. Well, when we got there, in conjunction with the leadership, after we learned the, the Thai language, the leadership said, there's a need, we'd like somebody to go work at this training school that we have. And it just seemed like God kept opening the doors for that and closing doors for us to go into tribal groups. And the training school, uh, it's a small, like a small Bible school. The facility is kind of like a Christian camp. Um, a little bit rustic, not super, super modern. But uh, for some of the tribal people that come there, it's a step up from their lifestyle. And what we do at that training center is we teach using the national language of Thailand, which we call Thai. The tribal people all come, the people who come, come from different tribal groups. They each have their own language. Um, the reason it works in Thailand and may not work in some of the other countries that New Tribes works in is because in Thailand, years ago, 50 years ago, the Thai government said, we're going to put schools all over this land. And so in small villages all over Thailand, there's schools, and all the teaching in those schools is done in the national language in Thai. So as the kids grow up, they learn both their tribal language and the Thai language. And so a school like we work in, um, there's difficulties with that, because the students come and they study in Thai, and then, but then they're going to go back to their own village, and they have to teach in their tribal language. Some of them can do that, make that transition pretty easily. Others can't. But the reason we're doing it is we're trying to be a blessing in places where there's not enough missionaries to go around. It would be better if we had a missionary, had a person that went there, learned their language, translated the Bible, translated Bible lessons into their language, taught them how to lead in their own language. What I'm doing is teaching them in Thai, giving them Bible lessons in Thai, and I'm saying, you go back and develop the program. And it's not the best way, but we believe it has borne fruit. Uh, the school's been there about 20 years. Um, some of you know that uh, we live in a valley, a floodplain. And last year, the, this is the rainy season, this time of year, July, June, July, August, and September, the first part of September. And last year, the rains were really heavy. And around our property, we own about 10 acres. We built a dike. They built a dike before I ever worked there. And uh, it's a, a meter and a half high. 
And, um, but last year when the rains came, they pounded our dike. And we were afraid they might wash the dike away. So we began to pray, what, what might we do to protect our dike? So the waters wouldn't come over and flood our property, flood our houses, flood our training center. And uh, the church here has been praying for that, and the Lord provided through several churches and several people, the Lord provided about $46,000. And uh, that was way more than my faith. <laughs> and I just praise the Lord for that. And so we spent a couple months uh, hauling in dirt, hauling in rock, and trying to protect our property. And it's the rainy season right now. It's been a mild rainy season, so it's not getting a very good, good test this year, and I'm glad for that. Um, we planted grass on top of that. We, we spent a little over half the money. And so we still got some more. So if the dike gets damaged again this year, we'll know where the soft spots are, the weak spots are, and we hope to, to build those up further. So thank you for your prayers in that. Um, you know, it's a it's an important lesson. We need to trust the Lord in all things. God is sovereign. God did not, it uh, wasn't a surprise to God that the property was going to get hit by hard waters, flood waters last year. And uh, it's just been a good reminder that, that God is in control. The situation with Beth's mom. Beth's mom went in the hospital one month ago yesterday. We were in Thailand. Um, so, you know, trust in the Lord for that. Should we? We already had a trip planned to the U.S. We had airplane tickets, but should we throw away one of those tickets and buy a new ticket for Beth to come to the States to help take care of her mom? And, um, there was reasons we decided not to do that. Beth's sister and brother were able to be here and help some. But God is sovereign. That didn't catch God by surprise either. And that whole situation has been just a really good reminder for me and for a lot of people that we're that close to going. And, you know, for us, for those of us that know the Lord, better than this place, we don't know. But we need to be ready every day, all the time. And uh, we just praise the Lord that God is sovereign, that God is in control, and that these situations, they cause us to trust Him more. They cause us to draw close to Him and to uh, praise Him. One other situation that some of you might know is um, we're guests in Thailand. We have to have a visa from the government to stay in Thailand, and they give us a visa, a, a one-year visa. And every year we have to renew our visa. Well, this year, because of some things that happened, it wasn't really the government's fault. Um, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> but uh, for a lot of missionaries in Thailand, the government this year decided, we're not going to give you your visas. Um, and so there's a little bit of panic there. How are we going to stay in the country, find a new, find a different way to get a visa? And um, because we were coming to the States, we only needed a 30-day visa to stay in the country for the 30 days before we are going to fly to America. So we, we just went out of the country and flew back in. You can get a 30-day visa as a tourist just by flying into the country. So that's what we did at that time. Um, other missionaries have had to find other ways to get a one-year visa. And um, we haven't done that yet, but there is a process, and it looks like we're going to be able to get visas and stay in Thailand. So we just praise the Lord for that. Continue to hope, have, have an open door for us to be there and stay there. Um, my family moved to Thailand in 1996. We lived in Chiang Mai. It's the biggest town in northern Thailand. You can bring a map of Thailand. There's a little map sitting out on the table out there. But um, we live in the northwest of Thailand, kind of close, fairly close to the Burmese border. Not too close, but fairly close to the Burmese border. And, uh, but we lived in Chiang Mai first for the first three years, learned the Thai language, and then at that time we moved to this training school. The name of the training school is on here. Oh, there's a picture of Thailand right there. But the school is on here, and the name of the school is in both Thai and in English. In English, it's called Church Development for Missions. And the idea is to teach the church, help the church um, in Thailand, be a blessing to the church in Thailand, that they might reach out to their own people and um, help them to come to know Jesus Christ. Um, we moved to this, this school in 1999. So we were three years in Chiang Mai, big city. Then we moved to a very rural rural area. The school that we worked at has been, been open for 28 years, 29 years. And um, they have, we have students from a small, small little group as three students 
in a term to as many as 40 students in a term. And um, the students study for about 36 weeks over a year. They come and study for uh, 11 weeks and then they're gone for 6 or 7 weeks for a break and they come back for 11 weeks. And then, so there's three terms currently that they come and stay with us. And then they go back and work in their own churches. I just want to read the purpose statement for the school that I work at. It says, the school exists to assist local tribal churches in developing teachers and leaders. That's why we're there, to help them. Um, we continue to say, we realize it's the responsibility of the churches to train and develop teachers, leaders. It's their responsibility to do it. However, we see currently that many tribal churches were established quickly and then sort of left on their own. Somebody went in, preached the gospel, there came some believers, but then whoever, whoever taught initially left too quick. And the people that were left there are kind of stranded. They're sheep without a leader, sheep without a shepherd. And uh, so thus at the present time, many of churches are, do not have sufficient leadership in place. We're seeking to help be a blessing. We're seeking to be a need. We work at the training center, which was set up primarily to help tribal leaders be better equipped to teach God's word. And our desire is that the students, and we ourselves, the teachers there, would grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. That we would delight in him, and thus go out and tell others about him, and then disciple those who come to know him. Um, our school has three teachers, myself, I'm the only foreigner. The other two teachers are Thai citizens, but they're also from a, a tribal group. They're from a tribal group called the Lawa Tribal Group. And those two men have been there over, one of them's been there over 20 years, and one's almost 20 years. So they've been there a long time. They're my mentors, they're my language helpers. Um, they help me understand the culture there. And I believe we have a good team. We don't always see eye to eye. We've had some big disagreements. But by the grace of God, we've been able to work together. And um, I just praise the Lord for the team he's put together. Both those men have families, have a wife and children. Uh, one of the men's children have graduated from college. The other man has a daughter who's four grades in my In ninth or tenth grade, I think. Um, what do we teach at the school? We teach the Bible. New Tribes Mission, the method we use, we call it building on firm foundations. And uh, the first lesson teaches about the book. What is this book? Who wrote it? Where did it come from? How did it get to us? Why is it important? And um, then the second lesson um, teaches kind of something that's similar that was mentioned in the Sunday school class by this gentleman over here. We teach the attributes of God. We begin in the second lesson to tell them, what's this book say about this person called God? Um, tribal people all have a belief in God. Um, Buddhism is the national language of Thailand, Thailand but uh, they all have other beliefs. Most of the tribal people, anyway, all have beliefs about a God also. Buddhism doesn't have a God. Uh, but they have beliefs in, a, in spiritual things. And so we begin to tell them about the Creator and what it's like. Um, I brought this little card here. It's a laminated card that I use. It's written in Thai. And uh, the first seven things on here are about, about God. The first one's uh, an attribute about God. It says... God communicates with man. That's kind of big words. But it means God likes to talk with people. He wants to communicate with us. And he communicated with us. He sent us his word. And he wants to talk to us. And he wants us to talk to him. So that's one of the things we talk about God. God is... When you read Thai, sometimes it just doesn't come out in English. <laughs> so he's almighty. He's over all things. And he's sovereign. He rules over everything. God lives everywhere. God dwells everywhere all the time. 
Uh, Thai people believe in spirits. Uh, everything that happens, well, not everything, but most everything bad that happens to you is caused by an evil spirit. That's what they believe. Uh, you get sick, it's a spirit. Somebody dies, it's a spirit. You lose something, you get in a wreck. Your cow dies, it's a spirit who did it. Um, so we teach them that God's a spirit, but he's different than the spirits they know about. And their idea of spirits is that it's the spirit of a dead person. Somebody died, that person's spirit's coming back and it's bothering us. And so we have to teach them, okay? There are there spirits? Yes, there are spirits. But are they the spirit of a dead person come back to life? No, that's not what a spirit is. Are there good spirits? Are there bad spirits? Where do the good spirits come from? Where do the bad spirits come from? The Bible says God is a spirit, but he's different than those spirits. All other spirits were created. God wasn't created. So we begin to teach these things to them. Um, God knows all things. God sees everything we do. Is that good news or bad news? Depends on how you live, right? <laughs> I'm glad God sees all we do. He knows everything we do. He takes care of us. He's with us all the time. But if we're doing something wicked, then we're not so happy about that. But um, God is full of love, mercy, and grace. <laughs> Do those words have meaning to us? Love, mercy, and grace? To a lot of people in Thailand, they don't know those words. Um, their religion doesn't really have that. It has, you know, they fear the spirits, they appease the spirits, they want to keep the spirits happy, but the spirits don't really love them. The spirits don't, like, you know, the spirits do good things for us if we keep the spirits happy, basically. So, we um, some of these attributes, uh, some of these other things on here are not attributes. Talk about man. Man is a sinner. Man is uh, worthy of hell and unable to save himself from hell. Also talks about uh, God being, uh, God has a plan to send a redeemer. Um, and Jesus Christ is that redeemer. We begin in Genesis when we teach what we call firm foundations. We begin in Genesis and we teach to the ascension of Christ first time through. And we teach that at the school as a model of what they might teach when they go back to their own tribal group. So it's, it's teaching non-believers. It's for non-believers primarily. But at our school we teach it to believers as a model of what they might teach to non-believers. And um, we, don't, we don't mention the name Jesus. For, um, I think there's 46 lessons in Thai in, in the first phase of our teaching. We don't mention Jesus for the first 30 lessons. We use the Old Testament to build a foundation of who is God, who are spirits, including Satan, the enemy of God, the enemy of man. What is man's problem? We're sinners, we can't save ourselves. And what is God's provision for our problem? And in the Old Testament, it doesn't say Jesus is the answer. It says a Redeemer, or a Savior, or the Deliverer. So we use that kind of term. The Promised One, the Messiah, the Christ. We use those terms. Until we get to the birth of Jesus. And then we mention His name. And then we say, all these things that were promised in the Old Testament about the One who was going to come, they're fulfilled in this man named Jesus. And then they begin to see, ah, He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. So we teach that, phase one, um, and then we, our students are believers already, but our hope is when they go back and teach in their villages, someone will come to believe. And then we have several other phases to develop disciples, uh, mentor them, that they might grow and um, become leaders. And as I mentioned before, if, if it was a missionary, a missionary would pull out these students we don't want them to pull out. We want them to stay there and be part of the leadership in their villages. Um, I want to I want to teach from the Word. I'm supposed to quit at 11:30. Chai Right? You should. You're supposed to quit when the Spirit tells you it's time to quit. Is that when my stomach growls? <laughs> a long while. If we went by that, I'd be gone already. <laughs> Your stomach growl. 
Um, the week before we came back to America, New Tribes Mission in Thailand, all the missionaries that are part of New Tribes Mission, there's about 60 of us, I guess, right now currently, we had a week-long meeting, retreat, like, and we do that every year. We call it a field conference, and we listen to the Word of God, um, we encourage one another, we get reports about the different ministry works that New Tribes is doing in Thailand. Beth ran a program for the children, all the missionary children, so it was like a BBS for the kids. Um, the high school kids, the older kids, helped Beth run that program. And there were several men who got to teach the, from the Word while we were there. And one man said this, he said, service begins with worship. And he said, worship begins with knowing God. And you know, we just sang about uh, worshiping God and loving God and serving God and knowing God. But there is an order to those things. If, if we think we've got to serve God and we start there, we're getting the, the cart before the horse. It, that's an outflow of knowing God. The more we know Him, I just mentioned the second lesson that we teach, we begin to talk about the attributes of God. Because that is the foundational, that's important. <laughs> that's the foundation. You have to know God. Um, salvation is a result of knowing God. Worship comes from knowing God. Service comes from knowing God. Loving God comes from knowing who He is. We don't love, I mean, as a Christian, we should love everyone. <laughs> but those we know the best, and we like who they are, we love best. And so the more we know God, the more we'll love Him, and the more we'll worship Him, and the more we'll serve Him. Our job, our job is to know God. Service is an outflow of knowing Him. That's my job in Thailand. That's your job here. This morning was mentioned about, you know, Hal and Beth have gone over and are missionaries. Um, well, God's called us to be that. And He doesn't call everyone to, to do that. He might call some of you. And that's a question, I think that's a legitimate question we should ask. God, do you want me to go? I don't think we should say, I'm not going. <laughs> but, but I think it's a legitimate question we should ask. He wants some to go. For some of you parents, you need to be willing to let your kids go. That was really hard for my folks <laughs> to let us go. But, it, um, but it's our job to uh, know God. As we know God, we'll worship Him. The more we know Him, the more we'll worship Him. The more we know Him, the more we'll trust Him. The more we know Him, the more we'll serve Him. Whether it's here in America or some other place in the world. Same is true for the students who come and study at the training center I work at. Same thing is true for you here and your children. Um, get to know God. Every lesson that we teach in the firm foundations of every, every lesson that we teach, the number one thing that needs to come out of that lesson is, do you know God better than you did when you started? It's not, what does God want me to do? That's important, but it's not the most important thing. Every time we open the book, his word. Our goal should be, wow, what, uh, our goal should be, where's God in this? What do I learn new about God? Or what do I uh, see again about God? I want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 17. Verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> My title that I wrote for this is, This is our God. This is what our God is like. He's in control. He knows everything. He dwells in all places. He controls nations and kingdoms, both in the present, in their, their, both their past, their present, and their future. And I wrote myself a question, so why do I struggle sometimes with trusting Him in my life for today? And um, as we see in Ezekiel, I just want to read verses 1 through the first part of 3. 
it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, pose a riddle, and speak a parable to the house of Israel, and say, Thus says the Lord God. I'll just stop there. I'm not going to have time to preach the whole chapter. Um, in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord. In my Bible, Lord is all in capitals. Anybody else see that? L-O-R-D, it's all capital letters. That has meaning. You guys know the meaning? Why is it all capitalized? Jehovah, okay. It's his covenant name. Jehovah, or in some of the new translations, they're using the term Yahweh. I'm not going to explain why that's there, but it comes because of translation. From Hebrew to English, okay? But that's a covenant name of God. It's the... The source of the message that Ezekiel got here, or the source of this book, came from Yahweh, came from the Creator, came from the God that's always existed, came from the God that's in control. The Word of Jehovah. Um, down in verse 3, it says, Thus says Lord, L is capitalized in mine, and then the next three letters are small, and then it says God, cap all capitals again. And that's the thing that the translators decided to do. The God that's capitalized there, again, is Jehovah. And the Lord there, it comes from the name Adonai. Okay. This name of God that's found in Ezekiel here, the Sovereign Lord, Yahweh, the God that's in control of all things and always has been and always will be, the God who has a plan from the beginning of creation. We're talking about our world yet. He has a plan it's before time. But from the beginning of this our known world to the end of this known world, God, that, that's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. He's in control. This term, Ezekiel used this term 217 times. Sovereign Lord, or as we see here, Lord God. In the whole rest of the Old Testament, this term is only used 103 times. Um, it stresses God's sovereign authority. It stresses God's covenant it stresses um, God's faithfulness. That's another one of the attributes we teach about God. God is faithful. It means anything He says, He brings about. He's not like us. He's not like politicians. Sometimes we make promises that we don't intend to keep. Sometimes we make promises that we want to keep and aren't able to bring about. But God's not like that. God is faithful. Anything He promises, He will bring about. This term, uh, Sovereign Lord, or Lord God here, uh, talks of, it, it has the idea that he's self-existent. He doesn't have to depend upon anything else. He existed before this world. He doesn't need food and water and light and heat. Um, he's always existed. He always will exist. He's eternal. All of him is everywhere, all the time. That's our God. In this chapter 17 here, it said, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, me there is Ezekiel. He's the writer of the book of Ezekiel. And the name Ezekiel means God will strengthen, or God will harden. And if you read Ezekiel, you realize this guy needed strengthening from the Lord. God asked him to do some things that were tough. Um, and God provided the strength. God was Ezekiel's strength. There's one, at one point, God said, I want you to illustrate a truth. I want you to illustrate something um, to Israel. Um, let me see. Ezekiel is a prophet who is living in captivity in Babylon. He had been in Israel. Israel is overrun by Nebuchadnezzar and by Babylon. And Ezekiel is a prophet in Babylon. But he sees visions of the Lord and he sees visions of the temple that are still back in Israel. And God is saying, I'm going to, I already took some of you captive, but I'm going to totally wipe out Jerusalem. I'm going to destroy the temple. I'm going to tear down the city. And, um, the people in Babylon didn't want to believe that. They thought, oh, just a short time and we're going to go back. We're God's chosen. We're God's faithful. Of course he's going to take us back. And 
his ego says, wrong, that's not what's going to happen. But uh, one time God tells Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel means God will strengthen. Here's one spot where Ezekiel needed strength. God tells him to lay on one side of his body for 390 days. And, then, and that's to illustrate the judgment of God on Israel. And then after 390 days, God says, now flip over on the other side and lay on that side for 40 days. And that's, uh, it was a parable. It was an illustration for Israel. Ezekiel was partially mute for many years. The only time he could talk was when he was telling the leaders about a judgment or about a discipline. When he was speaking for God. He didn't just have a uh, common everyday talk with others. That takes strength of the Lord. Another time he was told to shave all the hair off his body with a sword. And he's, and he's told what to do with each portion of the hair. Take a third and do this and a third and do that and take a little bit and throw in the fire and this is what's going to happen to Israel because of these things. I want to look, I just have a few minutes left. I'm not going to teach all of Ezekiel, but I, I just want to talk briefly. Um, we're, we're not. Uh, I'm going to look in Ezekiel chapter 1. What strengthened Ezekiel? Ezekiel needed strength to do these things that God asked him to do. And then, in verse 28 of chapter 1, Ezekiel 1, 28, the whole chapter, chapter 1, is a vision that Ezekiel had. And he sees something that's beyond description. That he doesn't have the words to describe it all. He tries to describe it, he does the best he can with faulty human wording. But uh, at the end of that, he says what he saw, verse 28. He said, What I saw was like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Jehovah. So he sees something that's radiant. It reminds him of a rainbow. If you read the whole thing, there's all kinds of strange uh, things that were there. But he says, this is what I saw. And that's something that God gave Ezekiel to strengthen him. He saw a vision of the Lord. And for us, for strength, I'm not expecting to see a vision like that. But I can know that God by reading the word. <coughs> strength for us comes from knowing God. Worship comes from knowing God. The strength to do service for God, wherever He's planted us, comes from knowing Him. Um, a vision of God's glory resulted in worship. The last part of verse 28. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. He fell down in worship. He worshiped His glory. And um, one of the speakers... Um, that last, last week before we came from Thailand, Peter said, missions begins with worship. Missions begins with worship. And I agree with that. Knowing God, God can move us. The other, one other thing in um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is like a commissioning of Ezekiel. God wants Ezekiel to tell his message. And he's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and it set him on his feet. His first commit, this is his first commissioning. There's another one that's later. His first commissioning was to preach, or to teach judgment that was going to come on Israel. You need strength to do that. To go to people and say, you're rebellious and judgment's coming upon you. The people didn't want to hear that. They didn't believe him, they didn't listen to him, they didn't respond to him. He needs strength. God provided it. God is our provider. Um, Ezekiel, my understanding, is was about 30 years old when he became a prophet, began to speak for God. That was the age. He was of the lineage where he was going to be a priest, to be a priest. And you, you don't become a priest until you're 30, so it's when Ezekiel should have began serving in the temple. So he knows a lot about the temple and a lot of the visions and things that he talks about in Ezekiel are about the temple. But instead of being becoming a priest, serving as a priest, God used him to serve as a prophet. God's word. Um, in Ezekiel 17, I'm not going to go through it, but God, it's a parable, it's kind of a story, and then the explanation of that story, God told him what the meaning was. And um, 
it talks about the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar coming in to destroy Jerusalem, just destroying Israel, taking the kings, uh, the king of Israel, and taking him to Babylon, and setting up a new king, and then that new king rebelling against the king of Nebuchadnezzar, the king, uh, uh, king Nebuchadnezzar. But God says, that king really rebelled against me. And again, just that idea that God's sovereign. The things Nebuchadnezzar did was God doing it. Um, the movement of the kings in Israel it was God doing it. That's our God. Um, the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says Jehovah God. I guess I would just encourage you guys. You know, get to know your God. Get to know what He says. It'll cause us to worship. It'll cause us to trust Him. It'll cause us to serve Him. Um, it'll cause us to go out and witness to those who don't know Him. It'll be our strength to disciple those who do know Him. That they might grow to serve Him. Um, there's a lot of you I don't know out here today. I'm assuming maybe wrongly, that you all know the Lord already, that you're all His children. But if you're not, Jehovah God is the one who uh, can help you have eternal life. And for those of us who do know Him, it's that same God that can help us in service, whatever He has for us to do. And uh, this morning I just want to give an altar call. If any of you feel, feel led to come forward to dedicate yourself to life, uh, your life to the Lord, whether it be for salvation or for serving Him, I just would ask you to come forward and we'll pray for you. Steve will be available to talk to any of you. And um, I guess we're going to sing a song. And during that song, if you um, feel the Lord nudging you, looking in your heart to come forward to pray for whatever, that I uh, just would encourage you to respond to Him to our Lord God.
before we close today, I'd like uh, Al and his family to come up. And uh, as a church body, we want to pray for you. Men, uh, ladies, let's come down and lay hands and uh, pray for these folks. Come on down. Remember, we, we want to do more than... We want to do supernatural things for them so that the Lord can do supernatural things through them. Okay? We want to ask the Lord to, uh, to touch them. Anybody else that wants to come forward? Now lead us in a, in a moment of prayer. Father, we, uh, we just come before your throne, Lord. And as, who we, as we take time to consider who you are, Father, we're just so grateful that you give us an opportunity to, to be involved in touching lives for your kingdom. And Lord, uh, I believe I've, I've felt a special spirit here today, a spirit that's uh, a heart that uh, desires to serve and, and serve uh, whatever it takes. And that's, uh, I'm glad that the, uh, the horse is in front of the cart in this regard. So we lift up Hal, we lift up his family to you, we lift up Marty to you today, Lord, and uh, we just ask, Lord, that uh, they would be especially blessed, and, and Lord, we're blessed each and every moment, because uh, we know who you are, but Lord, uh, sometimes we need that extra blessing, so we can feel uh, just a little closer to you. So we ask your blessings on, on each of these, and we just pray, Lord, that uh, You'll bring them home again safely when it's time again. And Lord, we, we ask your healing hands to be on Marty. Touch her. Help her to recover fully. You, we know, Lord, you still have much for her to do, to do and to further your kingdom. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, sing our closing. Are you ready? Doug's going to play something. Yes, we're standing on holy ground.